Nothing more beautiful than looking at who Jesus is. Amen? And uh, that song is so full of who Jesus is. That's what we need to be grounded in as uh, God's children. First John chapter 1 this morning, and we'll look at the, the whole chapter this morning. We are exploring each week a different aspect of wholeheartedness toward God. We saw the general concept of wholeheartedness toward God in 1 Samuel chapter 12. We saw the profile of a wholehearted church in Acts chapter 2. Last week we saw uh, the characteristics of wholehearted confession in Daniel chapter 9. This week we'll examine the nature of wholehearted fellowship with God. If you sit here this morning, a redeemed child of God, you have the most precious privilege a human being could enjoy. <laughs> fellowship with God. The reality of this privilege is that the creator of the universe who exists outside of our bounds of time and space has ordained and orchestrated that his creatures relate to him. The relationships with the most famous, the most influential, the most powerful people on this planet are far outside the realm of possibility for all of us in this room. Fellowship through a relationship with the source of all that exists is the most accessible opportunity available to you and me. You realize that? Sometimes we get stuck in the rut of thinking of what is impossible, that we would like to be possible in our lives, right? We think, oh man, that will never happen to me. I was in BJ's a couple weeks ago, and it was just really random. This other lady came up to me, and she's like, did you get your Mega Millions ticket yet? <laughs> she was pumped about this. Thing. How much of this I'm on the line? And... Uh, I am not a quick-witted person. I wish I was. I wish I was in that moment because there was plenty of uh, plenty of opportunities to say something, uh, plenty of things about the Lord that I, that I could have said, but I just <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I was, I was caught so off guard. But we think much of the time about things that we would like to be true that are far outside the realm of possibility in our lives. But I want you to understand this morning that fellowship with God is the most accessible opportunity available to you and me. It is the most available privilege that you and I enjoy in our lives. Sadly, for too many believers, fellowship with God is either a mystery or it is a neglected privilege. God is always calling his fellowship-starved children back to wholehearted fellowship with him. And if you're called by his name, then you are called to fellowship with God. I'd like this morning to examine three truths concerning fellowship with God it will help us to understand it and to practice it wholeheartedly. Let's pause. Let, well, let's read through 1 John 1, and then we'll pause for prayer. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the light was manifest, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This, then, is the message which you, that, you, that we have heard of him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with 
one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Our Father in heaven, as we approach your word this morning, we ask for your Holy Spirit to, Lord, to make our hearing sharp and keen, that we might know that which you would have us to see, to hear, and most importantly, to obey this morning. And Father, I pray that you would deal in our hearts concerning this matter of our fellowship with you. And I pray that you would, uh, Lord, break down the barriers that may be around the walls of our heart that hinder our fellowship with you. Lord, I just pray that you would do your work and that I wouldn't stand in the way and that nothing would stand in the way from you accomplishing in us that which is most pleasing and glorifying to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Three truths concerning fellowship with God this morning. Number one, I'd like you to consider the beginning of divine fellowship. The beginning of divine fellowship. In these first five verses, John uh, John uh, displays to his readers the Lord Jesus Christ. And he reveals Christ as the source of divine fellowship with God. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. He's describing Jesus there. Because he says in verse 2 that life was manifested. We've seen that life, we bear witness of the life, we show unto you that, that eternal life, which was with the Father, Jesus, and was manifested unto us, Jesus. That which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, or like us. And truly our fellowship is is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We've written these things, verse 4, that your joy may be full. And this is the message. That we've heard of Jesus and declare unto you that God is light and in him, in him is no darkness at all. The beginning of fellowship. It'll help us to grasp the need for fellowship. If we go back to the beginning of fellowship between God and man. In Genesis chapter 1, where we read of the creation of man, we come to understand that God initiated fellowship with mankind when he breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. That was the beginning of God's fellowship with mankind. Genesis 1, 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let, them, and, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, and uh, the male and female created he them. You get just a glimpse of the uh, creation of man there in Genesis chapter 2. We read, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God's creation of mankind in his image presents to us his plan for fellowship. We read there that God created man in his own image. And so God's creation of mankind in his image shows us God's plan for fellowship because the image of God in man is the means by which we can fellowship with God. You know, as beautiful as the rest of creation is, be it the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom or the heavenly bodies, you name it, only man has been made in the image of God and therefore is privileged with divine fellowship. 
To be made in the image of God means that God has equipped you and me by his spirit to manifest his glory. And bearing God's image to manifest God's glory becomes the means of our fellowship with God. As John begins this first epistle here, he points to Christ as the key to man's recovered fellowship with God. In, in verse 3, he says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. He writes declaring Christ to these believers based upon his uh, based upon his eyewitness testimony, but in declaring Christ, he points to his eternal nature. He says that Christ was from the beginning, that Christ was with the Father. And this is the same message that he gives in the opening of his gospel, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, where he writes, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, the Word, Jesus. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the life of men. According to John, Christ was in the beginning with God at creation, and without Him was not anything made. And in that creation moment, Jesus Christ placed the life that was within him into mankind, creating mankind in God's image to reflect God's glory. And how does God's glory come to be displayed in you and me? That glory comes through our fellowship with God. Our partaking of who God is. See, the beginning of fellowship, it began at the moment of creation. Jesus was there at the beginning. John writes now in 1 John chapter 1 how Jesus said that now is manifested to bring back divine fellowship between man and God. Why did he have to do that? Well, I'd like you to consider, number two, the breakdown of divine fellowship. We've seen the beginning of divine fellowship. God created us in his image. That through fellowship with him, we would bear his image to glorify him. But something happened, didn't it? We see the breakdown of divine fellowship. If you and I are to pursue a wholehearted fellowship with God, it's vital that we understand how divine fellowship broke down and how it breaks down. We saw in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God making man in his own image and equipping him for fellowship. But in Genesis chapter 3, we see man causing a break in that fellowship through disobedience. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, and the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also her husband with her and he did eat. The eyes of them both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Broken fellowship. In this moment, the image of God as it had been perfectly placed in that first man and that first woman, the image of God was cut off. That fellowship between Adam and Eve and their creator was cut off in that moment because of their sin. They were no longer able to reflect the glory of the image of God until atonement was made their sin. They hid themselves 
from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. See the breakdown in fellowship? Sin entered the scene. Fellowship between God and man was broken. Paul said, in Adam, all die. In other words, for you and me, we all experience what Adam and Eve experienced because of our sin. Broken fellowship with God. In Adam, all die. All are separated from God. We are born in broken fellowship with God because of our inherited sin nature. And today, even though you and I know Christ as our Savior, we allow broken communion with God as we allow sin in our lives. Take note in our text of John's description of that breakdown of divine fellowship, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light as he's in the light, then we do have fellowship one with another, us and God. In the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say, however, that we have no sin, no sin nature, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. John describes here the breakdown of divine fellowship. Sin is the problem. Sin cuts off our communion, our communication with God. Our partaking of his nature is cut off by sin. The statement that John makes is clear. Look, there is no fellowship between God and the believer when the believer walks in darkness. When he walks in sin, when he tolerates or allows sin to rule and reign. There's no fellowship there. There is only fellowship, he says in verse 7, by walking in the light. Then in verse 8, he says, look, if you say anything contrary, if you believe anything contrary, if you live contrary to this truth, that you cannot walk in darkness and have fellowship with God. And you are self-deceived and you're practicing or you're living a lie. Notice how he says in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You see the breakdown of divine fellowship between us and God because of sin. When sin enters the picture, God's image is hidden. Adam and Eve hid themselves amongst the trees of the garden. And that picture is for us, for you and me, the hiding of God's image upon our life when sin enters, when we walk in darkness. But there is not just a breakdown of divine fellowship, there's a blessing of divine fellowship as well. We see that in verses 9 and 10. Two blessings of divine fellowship. Number one, fellowship with God can be restored. It can be restored. Genesis, in fact, gives us the story of restored fellowship. Turn with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 4. We find in chapter 3 the fall of man. We saw fellowship broken, cut off between God and the first man and the first woman. But in chapter 4, we begin to see fellowship with God being restored. And what John says in 1 John 1, 9 is pictured here. In Genesis chapter 4, notice with me in verse 1. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, and there came, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. 
Here in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, we see the restoration of fellowship. We find Eve crediting God's grace, God's favor with giving her a son. She conceives and bears Cain, and she credits God with that son. She credits God's grace and God's favor in her life with a baby, this son. We see fellowship has been restored between man and God. In Genesis chapter 4 also, we find Abel's fellowship with God through the offering of worship that he brought before God. Notice in verse 4, Abel. He also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And get this, the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Restored fellowship with God. Adam and Eve, boy, did they mess up. They disobeyed. They cut off their fellowship between them and God. But what happened? Grace restored that fellowship. And now they have taught their sons the truth and the wonderful privilege that they have of fellowship with God. And here in verse 4, Abel is bringing the firstlings of his flock, and the Lord has respect unto Abel and to his offering. Unfortunately, Cain didn't have a proper fellowship with God, and Abel, of course, was killed by Cain, but we find at the end of chapter 4 that God raised up another godly son in the place of Abel. And through him we find man's fellowship with God being perpetuated. Verse, chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God, saith she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos, and then began then to call upon the name of the Lord. What a wonderful picture we have in chapter 4 of fellowship with God after it had been cut off, being now restored by God's forgiveness and by God's grace. And mankind is offering worshipful respect toward God. And mankind now is beginning to call upon the name of the Lord, to claim God as their own in beautiful fellowship and relationship. You see, God is a fellowship restoring John stresses that back in our text in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. He says, if we confess our sins, if we agree with God about our sins, if we recognize and we understand and we confront our sin and the fact that it is cut off fellowship, communion, communication with God, if we confess that he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is a fellowship restoring God. Verse 9 shows us the way here. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Verse 10 shows us that any other way is unproductive. If we deny our sin, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. There is no fellowship. But the blessing of divine fellowship is that fellowship with God can be restored after it's been broken. Fellowship is restored through simple confession and faith. 
God requires honesty about the sin that has broken the fellowship. We look at this. We looked at this in, in, in detail last Sunday when we talked about wholehearted confession. But upon confession, the believer can accept by faith the promise of verse 9 and believe that fellowship has been, has been restored. What is the promise? He is faithful. He is just. Forgive us and to cleanse us. And if we confess our sins and if we accept by faith his forgiveness and his cleansing, then fellowship can be restored. The tragic mistake that many make is to doubt that forgiveness has been granted. And to continue to live as if fellowship is still broken. You ever done that? Have you ever sinned? Been grieved over that sin at the conviction of the Holy Spirit? Confessed your sin to God? But haven't believed that you've been forgiven and cleansed? Folks, fellowship has been restored. Partake in that fellowship. You have to understand that fellowship is not governed by feelings. Fellowship is governed by faith. Accept the promises of God. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. You say, well, I, have, I just have to learn to forgive myself. No, you have to learn to accept God's forgiveness. That's the blessing of divine fellowship. Fellowship with God can be restored. I'd like you to consider, secondly, the second blessing of divine fellowship is that it can be retained. Fellowship with God can be retained. Christ gave his disciples some encouraging truth in the Gospel of John. Chapter 15, we read his words. I'd like you to turn over there with me briefly, if you would. And consider what Jesus said about fellowship. He says in verse 3, John 15, 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. What does that mean? That means fellowship is there. Fellowship is open. There are no hindrances. And so what does he say in verse 4? Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. And he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same branch forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. You see, fellowship with God can be retained. The connection to the vine is found in abiding. Fellowship with God need not be broken. It can continue as long as the child of God remains in his proper place of spiritual dwelling, and that is in Christ. Abide in me, Jesus says. Abide in me, and you will know. Fellowship. So the beginning of divine fellowship and the breakdown of it, we've seen the blessing of divine fellowship in that it can be restored and it can be retained as we abide in Christ. And before we close, I'd like to give you three quick thoughts. How to have wholehearted fellowship with God. These are practical, but they're from the scripture. <clears throat> Number one, you must properly deal with sin. Remember what John said. If you say you have fellowship with God and yet you walk in darkness, you make him a liar. You are not in fellowship with God. And so in order to have wholehearted fellowship with God, in order to fully partake of God's image in you, properly deal with sin. 
sometimes in our broken, earthly relationships, the other person is genuinely the cause. Not so in our relationship with God. He is never the cause of broken fellowship. It is always our wrongdoing. If you pursue a wholehearted fellowship with God, then you will properly deal with your sin. You will take it seriously. Psalm 66 and verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So if you want a wholehearted fellowship with God, then you have to properly deal with your sin. But number two, you must also give fellowship its proper priority. Remember, fellowship is communion. And communion with God takes place through the consumption of and obedience to his word, through communication to him in prayer, and through obedience to the Holy Spirit within. This is how we fellowship with God. And all of these things must be prioritized in our lives that are filled with so many other cares and responsibilities and needs. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God in his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He's talking about people who had all kinds of worries and cares and concerns. If you're going to have a proper, wholehearted fellowship with God, then you must give that fellowship its proper priority. <coughs> You must organize everything else in your life under your relationship and your fellowship with God. It must take proper priority. So number one, if you're going to have a wholehearted fellowship with God, you must properly deal with sin. Number two, you must give fellowship its proper priority. But number three, you need to cultivate a seeking heart. In order to grow in your fellowship with God, and by the way, that's exactly what fellowship with God is. It, it is a growing process. It is becoming more and more, or maybe I should say it is the means by which we become more and more conformed to the image of Christ. It's the means by which the image of God that he originally put inside of man becomes more and more visible to those around us. We must cultivate a seeking heart. In order to grow in our, in our fellowship with God, we must change our eating and drinking habits. You say, oh, pastor, don't you dare put me on a diet. Not physically, spiritually. To grow in your fellowship with God, you must change your eating and drinking habits. What do I mean? Well, you must choose a different table to eat at. And we must choose a different well to drink from. Too much of the time we are gorging ourselves on the things of this world. And we're using this book in our quiet time with God as just kind of a little appetizer. Hey, I did my duty 10 minutes, 15 minutes in the Word of God and prayer. I can go on with my day. That's not fellowship with God. You and I need to cultivate a seeking heart. We need to get up from the table we're sitting at and go over to a table that's filled with spiritual food. Stop drinking from a well that has a bottom and drink from the well of eternal life that is endless. In other words, stop seeking for satisfaction in temporal places so that you can develop then a hunger and a thirst for God's righteousness. Isn't that what Jesus said? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they, here's the promise, shall be filled. You must cultivate a seeking heart that grows and develops our fellowship with God. It's the only way you and I can be truly satisfied.
I trust you understand this morning your purpose as a creation of God. To bear his image by means of a personal, wholehearted fellowship with him. If you understand that this morning, then I ask you this question. What is the level of quality of the fellowship between you and your God? Do you maintain open lines of communication with him? Do you abide in him? Does a hunger and a thirst for God define you? God's seeking for wholehearted fellowship with his people, and he's calling us this morning to evaluate our fellowship with him. Father in heaven, we ask you this morning to open our spiritual eyes to see our need. Lord, I pray that you would make us desperate and needy. Lord, that takes a real humbling of our hearts to go from independence to God dependence. And I pray that you would do that work in each of us, Lord, that where we have been pursuing that which satisfies temporarily, or that we would begin now anew and fresh, a wholehearted fellowship with you. Lord, I pray that your spirit would bring to the surface that which is dragging us down and hindering us in our walking in the light. Father, that we would take 1 John 1, 9, and that we would practice it and stand upon it and believe it, that we would confess our sins and that we would trust you to be faithful and just. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, do this work in us. Bring us into fellowship with you. Teach us what that means, I pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.